Continuing in our study of the Holy Spirit, His activity, and throughout the Scriptures, broad overview of of His uh, of how the Spirit works in different aspects, different parts of the Bible. And this week we are going to be discussing the Holy Spirit in the prophets or in the prophetic tradition. Um, Brian and Angela did a great job last week. Indeed, it's <laughs> excellent. Excellent, yeah. It, and as they said, and I think everyone says to start out, it's, it's, and Rick said it too, it's difficult to just try and, like, hold to, like, your specific little topic or whatever because there's so much um, bleed over into other parts and yeah. stuff like, well, what do you mean in the prophets? I mean, David was a prophet. You know, I mean, well, you true. know, you got... All kinds of different ways where, it, I mean, Moses was a prophet, you know, and so it, it's, it's more than just, oh, the prophetic books that we think of, though we will be looking at those tonight. The, it's important as we go through and we talk about this, like, for instance, last week we were in the Psalms and, and in the Pentateuch and, and, and in the historical books and, and stuff like that, and it's like, so we're in the Old Testament, and, and honestly, the the Old Testament, maybe not as much for our group anymore. We've, we've I think, tried to hit it pretty yeah. pretty well in, in our groups. But, like, largely, the church in, 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 in our traditions and, and stuff like that, or in even modern Christianity and, and in the West, are very... Um, under taught as it regards the the Old Testament scriptures there's a very very limited understanding rather there's there's actually quite a large assumption that they're somewhat irrelevant because Jesus came and kind of did away with all that weird Jewish stuff and we don't need that anymore we've got Jesus and well, there's a couple of denominations that actually say that the Old Testament is done, right. and they don't read it at all. They don't any. Uh, that's not, the Marcionist. That's the official policy. Uh, that's that's the official that's policy. Yep. Just a bad habit. No. That's what their intention is. That's what their intention is. Wow. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. It, it is bizarre because you know the the truth is the, the large majority of of, uh, of of Christ one of the oh, yeah. churches of the Church of Christ I think it is. One of them. There's, there's two of them. It's, I think it's the Church of Christ. Church maybe. of Christ, yeah. and they, they don't. They're ones that don't have any musical instruments in their, in their services at all. Um, it, it's all just what they take out of the New Testament. So, like the Psalms, you know, that's an old Jewish thing that we don't do that. And so, you know, you go. Well, it is, but you can still have a lot of value. <laughs> right. And it's true. Yeah. The Old Testament is largely a Jewish narrative. And really, uh, most, of the, most of the New Testament is too. It's written by Jews to mostly Jews. You know, I mean, this is like the majority of the Bible is this. Is there, is there anything written by somebody that isn't Jewish? But most likely Luke, Luke. but not even everybody Luke agrees was, with that. Luke was, was I've read some Greek. I've read some things that suggest that Luke could have been a Jew. Um, yeah, or part Jew anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, but but that would probably be the only one. So yeah, it's very it's a very Jewish book, and so <laughs> it it gives us it, it would behoove us to understand something about Jewish culture to understand. Okay, can you imagine someone in Ethiopia reading a book about life in the United States in 2023? In, in, a, in a remote part of Africa somewhere, in, and we're using modern language, modern ideas, we're talking about TikTok, we're talking about, <laughs> I mean, it would be all but Chinese to them. And it would, they would have to really study our culture to understand what the book is talking about. And, like, and likewise, we ought to do the same. Um, Speaking of like the New Testament, largely it's thought, I think, by many people that the Old Testament, you maybe have heard this, the Old Testament reveals the, the, the New Testament reveals the Old Testament, when rather I think it's actually the complete opposite. I think the Old Testament helps us understand what the New Testament writers are saying. And so a lack of understanding of the Old Testament 
leads us to a lack of understanding of the New Testament, what it's communicating. And so the good thing is that it's pretty much communicating the same thing all the way throughout. And, but we want to get an idea of what is being said so that we can, and if you do, the more you understand what's happening in the Old Testament scriptures, you, you really start to see that Jesus and the apostles aren't really saying anything all that different. They're, they're, cat, they're, 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 they're kind of portrayed as these revolutionaries who are like down with Judaism, up with non-Judaism. And, and, and really, the disciples and Jesus couldn't have been more traditional Jews. They, 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 they didn't stop observing the feast. They didn't have stop observing the temple rituals. They didn't stop circumcising. They didn't stop the, so many uh, uh, purity rituals that they needed to observe. Even in the book of Acts, it's all over the book of Acts. They organized their, their schedules around being in Jerusalem at the festival times. And they organized their schedules like, oh, I'm going to Jerusalem, but I, I got this guy who's not circumcised, and that might be a problem. I'm going to have him circumcised so that they understand we're not doing away with Judaism as we know it, you know, so it's it's quite a Jewish book, and so Paul was the same way. Same way, he he went out of his way, you know, to to maintain his Jewish identity, and he I mean he boasts in it obviously many times, you know, and so not that he's and the difference is that people assume that if you are an observant Jew, that somehow that is that keeps you from being able to be. A follower of Jesus through faith, which was just never an, an, a, a thought in their minds. They're like, "Oh, yeah, the, all the stuff that the that our scriptures, meaning the the Tanakh, the Old Testament, talked about, prophesied about the Messiah. Well, this is him. So we just keep doing everything. But now we actually have a figure for, with whom to like set our our He's, understanding. He is the Messiah, right? Yeah. And so, um, so that gets us into the old. So we have this. Lack of understanding because it's really given no place of prominence is generally how it seems to me um, that the Old Testament, the Tanakh, is what they call the Old Testament scriptures. And so at, at best, we're just a little bit ignorant. At worst, it causes us to misunderstand what's being said altogether, and, and we don't want that. One of the best things I've ever heard someone say and when, when someone asked them, well, what do you think that scripture means? And he said... It doesn't matter what I think it means. It only matters what he was communicating, what they would have understood. That's the important thing about the scriptures. It has nothing to do with what it would have meant 2,000 years from now, uh, from now in America. When I'm saying something to anyone here, and I'm communicating something about modern times, anyone that were to hear that conversation 100, 250, 3,000 years in the future, it wouldn't matter what they thought I was saying. It would matter what I was trying to communicate. <laughs> and so that's the same thing. We're trying to understand what the writers are trying to communicate. Not, you know, you don't pick up Lord of the Rings by like, well, I know it says he's a hobbit, but I want to think he's just a koala bear. <laughs> like, you don't get to just decide who the people in the story are, right? That's kind of how it works. So we want to have an understanding. And so I, I actually appreciate this thing. We'll, we'll go through some of the, the spirits activity and the prophets. But the, the thing is, like we all have said to start our, our teaching, I'll just continue the tradition. The Holy Spirit is not a new thing to them. <laughs> and, and what's interesting about this is that the fact that there's no real instruction about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is his job? What's his role in this whole thing of creation and, and human history? Like, it's never talked about like that, right? Which leads us to believe that it's probably just normal. Like, it's so normal they didn't feel the need to explain it because everybody kind of knows that the Spirit's there, he has a role, he does this, he does that, he speaks like this, he does this. So it, it, there's no real clear, clear explanation, which kind of makes you think it's just the way it was. And no one really thought any differently. Like they didn't really think of life without the Spirit being involved on some level. And so we see it in the book of Acts, but the, from the Spirit hovering over the great deep, 
to the end of the age when the Lord returns, while Jewish and Gentile believers alike are dying for their faith, holding on to, for dear life, trying not to abandon the Lord as, as pressures get difficult. The Holy Spirit is the one there sustaining them from bookend to bookend. Yeah. He's always been at work, and, he's, and he will be until the end of the age. And so the, the Jewish scriptures seem to talk about the Spirit as though he was just God's agent by which he, he, he did things. He, he spoke through people, but the Spirit was definitely active in doing things as well. You know, he's active in, in, in creation. He's active in, in talking to the prophets. He's, the Spirit is, is quite active in bringing the dead to life, as, as we see in Ezekiel 37. And so it's a little bit of a complicated subject as we talk about it because it's, it's synonymous with the word breath or wind. And so it's a difficult thing to say, well, and it will breathe into them. Yeah. Well, what, do you, what does that mean? Is he just breathing his <clears throat> breath? Or is that the breath of life and the spirit is the breath of life? And so, I mean, it's not super simple on some level, but in that is a Jewish way. For sure. <laughs> Nothing simple for them. You know, you ask two Jews for an opinion, you come out with three, is, is kind of how it goes. And so. I can vouch for that. Yeah. And so, this is <laughs> the expectation. He's there, he has a role, and people didn't really question it or feel the need to explain it in great detail. So, we'll talk about some of the ways the Spirit is used in the, in the Old Testament, especially as it relates to the prophets, as we think of them. But um, the Spirit, one of the ways he's most primarily used in the, in the prophets is that he gives utterance to the word of the Lord. And so it's funny, it's probably not all that common, but we're talking about sometimes we feel like, oh, we feel like the Holy Spirit comes, and then is, is, are we just like in a trance because the Spirit comes upon us? I, no, generally that's not how it works, but it did work like that a few times. <laughs> sometimes, I mean, yeah. sometimes, yeah, when you get taken up, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, I mean, they had probably trance-like experiences, you know. And so probably not, the con it's probably the exception. But yeah, that, that stuff is a work of the Spirit. You know, it's, they get taken up in the Spirit is how they might communicate it. So in Ezekiel 11, verse 5, Ezekiel says, The Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say, thus says the Lord, so you think, house of Israel, for I know your thoughts. So point isn't to get into the passage, but rather it said the Spirit came upon me and he instructed Ezekiel, say this. And so he is the agent bringing the word of the Lord to the messenger and instructing him what to say. And so on some level we see the Spirit being a messenger of yeah. the word from the Father that, that he wants to go out to the people and he has an, uh, a human agent that he sends uh, right. to communicate it. But the Spirit is the one who brings the message, right? Yeah, that's good. So the outpouring of the Spirit, or the, um, the, pro the, the prophets have a general theme to them, all of them. They're specifically related to the covenants. They're almost always about, they're almost always directly talking to Israel, though there are pronouncements of judgment and right. sometimes blessing on Gentile nations. Right. But the large majority <laughs> is directed towards Israel, for better or for worse, sometimes terrible judgments, sometimes great blessing, you know. But generally, it's speaking to the house of Israel, and it's related to the covenants in that most of the time they're coming under judgment because they've rebelled against the covenants, they've forsaken the covenant. And so this is God speaking to them, saying, remember, in Deuteronomy, I told you, if you, if you broke the covenant, all these things would come upon you. I can't not do this. I would be a liar and untrustworthy if I did, if I did not follow through. And so he's got to. And so there is a general um, theme, though it's different in each one. Because they are, at times, they are prophesying about current events. Sometimes about the end of the age. Yeah. Sometimes the current events seem to be precursors to things that will happen in, in, in full measure at the end of the age. It's hard to say. It's hard to talk about 
prophetic words being partially fulfilled or precursors. I mean, there's different ways to look at it, but oftentimes the, the, the prophecies that happen, they seem in, in a lot of ways to go, oh, that's when, oh, that was the Babylonian invasion. That's what that prophecy was about for sure. But then oftentimes if you read the prophecy through, you're like, well, that didn't happen and that hasn't happened yet. And well, that happened, but not that part. And you go, well, heck, I don't know if we can say that that prophecy actually came became fulfilled because not all of it happened you know and it's not like these aren't really like us where we're like we get like half of the prophetic word right you know or like (laughs) you know like i feel like the lord just wants you to know that he loves you and do do you have a brother that you're not close to anymore no no siblings well the lord loves you you know that's not that's not that kind of prophetic word you know um they it's going to be fulfilled to the T, even if it hasn't already been, or even if only part of it has, then whether you want to call it partially fulfilled or a precursor to its actual fulfillment, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's not that important, I don't think. So um, the expectation of the Spirit was also that it would be poured out on all flesh. Now, all flesh is a, is a term that can be debated, but as we think about the Joel 2 passage, where he says, it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind or all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. So the, the idea is that, well, who is all flesh? Well, he's, he's obviously talking to an audience, and the audience isn't the entire world. So is there a chance he means that the spirit will be poured out on every person that is alive on the earth at that time, maybe, or he's talking to all flesh of you people that I'm talking to, your sons and your daughters. Right. Because if I said something to you guys as, hey, your sons and your daughters are going to get a free ice cream cone when they come to the picnic. <laughs> I don't want the whole world showing up expecting a whole <laughs> ice cream cone because that wasn't my intent, right? Now, I'm not saying that I think 100% that's what it's saying, but... Reading in context, trying to understand that all flesh, it might be that he's saying your sons and your daughters will dream, will prophesy and dream dreams and all that kind of stuff. And then you think about the outpouring in Acts, mm-hmm. and you think, and Peter goes, "This is that, right?" You know, and obviously it wasn't at that moment of time poured right. out on all the flesh in the entire earth, right? You know? And it was poured out on it was Pentecost. Guess who was in the room? Right. bunch of Jewish people. bunch of Jewish people that, that their <laughs> you know, sons and daughters. Now, they came yeah. in from other lands, and they had different languages. We know that. But they were Jewish people that were there to celebrate the feast. You know? And so, anyways, that's neither here nor there, except for they expected the Spirit to be poured out. And, and they didn't have to explain. Well, and so this is what happens when the Spirit's poured out, everybody. Joel doesn't have to elaborate on that. It's, it's the word of the Lord coming forth, and they expect it to happen. Um. And there's other re- references. You got Acts several times in Acts. Ezekiel. This, it talks about the Spirit being poured out and coming upon. You know, like we often think that maybe with some of the the, the major prophets that the um, the Spirit like apprehended them. Right there, this is like next level Spirit <laughs> stuff as opposed to I felt like the Lord might have said, <laughs> but but he just uses the word. The spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Yeah. You know, and those t- often, sometimes we just think of that as like the lesser of the terms. He, he didn't fill him. He, he wasn't indwelt by the spirit. But we think, whoa, the spirit fell upon Saul. And he prophesied as kind of like a bad dude. You know, and it's like, well, yeah, but it also fell upon Ezekiel. Yeah. You know, so we, we try to. It's probably best not to just try and put a bunch of boxes together because it doesn't really fit well if, when we try to do that. And so the Spirit will fall, give utterance, bring a message. He, they, there's an expectation of an outpouring. There's grieving the Spirit. Yeah. That's interesting. So they see him as some personhood uh, that can be grieved. And that's not a good thing. Right? And um, yeah. Isaiah 63, it says, But they rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. 
the Lord's Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy and fought against them. So, remember, can anyone else think of a time where the scriptures talk about grieving the Spirit? In the, in the, New, the New Testament, Testament yeah. talk about don't, don't grieve, grieve the, the Spirit. Spirit. What, is it likely they invented something, or did they already have some context for what that meant? And why would he warn them of that? Oh, because he turned himself to become their enemy, and he fought against them. Don't grieve the Spirit. It's not going to go well for you. You know, and so... Um, the spirit was an indicator oftentimes in the Old Testament when the spirit came upon someone it was an indicator of the Lord's choosing of a man it was like him saying I approve of this person we see it with Moses the elders of Israel and in, in numbers and Joshua um, with David and Saul the spirit coming upon them and, and it was a sign of his choosing of them and which you can really carry that forward too into the New Testament when the spirit fell upon the upper room, it was like the Lord showing, I am endorsing these men. Yeah. And Jesus was baptized, spirit came on him. Of course, right. Psalm, Psalm 2, I mean, that, there's a lot in that one too. But the spirit coming upon him, total, like, and the Lord even says it right from heaven. This is my son, I am choosing him. Right. Right. And so the, the spirit coming upon someone could have been a, a, the Lord saying, I am choosing this man. Right? For better, for worse, right? I mean, Saul didn't end up so, being so great. But the Lord's choosing, and then their actions afterwards are a totally different thing. And so, we can go through the, I don't, we're not going to go through the passages, but he calls all these people, and we see, you know, and it says, like, for instance, when he calls David, and I'll say David because he's one of the prophets, and he says in um, 1 Samuel 16, 11, Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. So he brought him in. Now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes. He was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Like, like Neo. <laughs> then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of the brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon, came mightily upon David from that day forward. Yeah. Like what, like every day? Or what that looked like. was a spirit yeah. within him? You know, like, I mean, we don't get a lot of commentary on it, but he came upon him. And so, um, and of course, the, the one with Saul is, is funny, right? The spirit of God possessed him, and he <laughs> fell into a prophetic frenzy with, uh, with the other prophets of the, uh, that he was yeah. around. So the prophets share a common theme, and that is repent. The Lord is coming if you don't, judgment is at your door. And so those are three very simple phrases, but they pack a lot to them. Yeah. Repent, everybody knows what that means. It wasn't say sorry, it was stop worshiping idols, stop treating the, the foreigners with such disdain, stop basically profaning God's name among the earth because you're God's people, Yahweh chose you, they, these people have their gods, and they act in a certain way because that's how their gods are. And so everyone knows, oh, the Canaanites, they act this barbaric and evil way because they serve barbaric and evil gods. Yes, right. Right? But Yahweh is not like that. But you're making people think I am. And so I take quite an exception to that. And so he, he says, repent. Stop acting like that. Okay? It's not enough to just say, oh, sorry. We, you know, No. Stop acting like that or judgment is at your door. And so not only that, though, the, the prophets are also full of good news. Yeah, amen. When you repent, blessing is going to be poured out on the land. Yeah. You know, and then sometimes it was temporal blessing because they were going to fall away again in the future. But there's the good news that is he, he might bring a message of repent and judgment is coming, but he always brings the message, but... I will restore the fortunes of Israel. Yeah. And, and he always left them with hope, even after a pronouncement of judgment. Basically to keep them from like, probably despairing unto death when they <laughs> did go into captivity or something like that. So the activity of the Spirit is a common expectation. Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. For some reason, maybe it's just me, but in my growing up in the church tradition that I did, 
for some reason, there's like this, this like um, knee-jerk reaction to think, oh, if the Spirit falls upon you, that's lesser than the Spirit being within you. I don't know where that comes from, but it just seems like I've heard that enough times to where that's like instantly what I think. Falling upon and being filled with one is better than the other. And, I mean, I put my spirit upon the Messiah. It seems to be good enough, you know, to qualify. You know, the um, Isaiah 6, 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Obviously, a messianic prophecy about Jesus, yeah. only Jesus, and no one else. Right. Um, and then it talks about what he's going to do. And, you know... He says, he sent me to bind up the broken heart, pro- proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, Jesus comes and he reads this right in the temple. And he's yeah. like, this has been fulfilled in your house. Now, but he didn't do all those things, right? Because these things, he did not um, bind up all the brokenhearted, free all the captives, Proclaim freedom. So largely everyone that understands what Isaiah is talking about is literal events that the Messiah will do upon his second coming. He will literally free people from prison camps, Jewish people. As he comes back to the land of Israel, he'll come setting people free, bringing them out of prisons and dungeons and prison camps, and literally bringing liberty to captors and and freedom to prisoners, saying this is the favorable year of God you can come back to the land now, kind of a thing. And, and Jesus, I mean, he ended up getting crucified, right? I mean, much less feels like he, he like, fulfilled the whole shebang. But um, after, uh, and, and so in Isaiah 1, he's talking about the gospel, messes, good news. But then he says in Isaiah 127, he goes on to say, Zion will re- be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. So this is Isaiah talking about repent. Righteousness and freedom and liberty comes when you repent, right? And, and Jesus confirms this message when he says right. to, the, to the elders, you will no longer see me until in, 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 in this land until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Right? Repent, because until you repent, because obviously he's pronouncing judgment on the on the leadership of the day. And so um, in Isaiah 30, for thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance and rest, you will be saved. Yeah. Another call to repent, right? Yeah. And so Isaiah is talking about the call to repent. This is what the pr- prophets do. And if the prophets are doing it, then that means this is what the Spirit is saying. Yeah. Okay. And so um, then there's, uh, Isaiah goes on in um, chapter 11, he talks about the different kind of characteristics or aspects of the Holy Spirit. And he says, um, a branch from his roots will come up, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, talking about the Messiah, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Like the spirit, in this spirit, each spirit is the Ruah, is that name. Yeah. That, it, that they use for the, the, the Holy Spirit or the wind or the breath of God. So um, these are things that he does. He's, he gives counsel. He gives proper, he gives wisdom from God and, and understanding. And, and, he, and he imparts the, the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. This is what he does. He gives these things to people. And so uh, in Isaiah 44, it says that, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and blessing on your descendants. And this is the blessing that's being proclaimed after he calls them to repentance. And if you repent, this is what's coming your way. And so Ezekiel, very similarly, um, we already talked about, he says, he, he told me to say. Then he calls Israel to repent in Ezekiel 18 he says but the house of israel says the way of the lord is not right are not my ways right O house of israel he goes on down and he says repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you cast away from all your tr- transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit so he's saying therefore at the end he says therefore repent and live 
Okay, so there's Ezekiel's call to repentance. And then Ezekiel has an expectation of the Spirit being poured out. And he goes in Ezekiel 37, very famous to all of us. I will put my spirit within you, my ruah, my spirit, my breath, my wind, whatever, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. And so this is really a prophecy of the Lord raising the dead to life. And how do they live again? Because his spirit dwells within them, which gives them life. And so and we know that many passages in the Old Testament talk about the spirit giving life to us. And so he's going, this is what I'm going to do when I come back, when you're repentant, when you call upon my name. So that there's an expectation that he, the spirit would be in their midst. You know, that, he talks about that a lot. In, um, in Haggai 2, he says, as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. I promised you my spirit would be with you, you know. And so the, the Spirit gave them a, a, a source of courage and, and might. He gave them confidence to obey the Lord when the Spirit was with them. They're like, okay, I mean, if we obey, he said he'd, he'd dwell in our midst, you know. And it was very obvious when they had turned away. But it wasn't like, oh, we had a bad week. It's decades. It's hundreds <laughs> of years of sin going on before the Lord actually brings judgment. I mean, he's slow to Slow anger down. and the rich in loving kindness yeah. and he's not just ready to crack the whip if they have a bad day right. i mean we're talking about generations of rebellion and wickedness and idolatry before the lord really brought the hammer and then the only point he did that was to get them to turn back to right. him it was his deception. yeah them so yeah. zachariah says this is the word of the Lord, is Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. You know, here's the activity of the spirit accomplishing the will of God, not the strength of man. You know, and he goes in Jeremiah um, 15, 7, he says, I will winnow them with a winnowing fork at the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people. They did not repent. So here's another call to repentance because this is what's coming down if you don't. He says, if a nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring. Like, it just takes turning of the heart. I don't want to do this. He's like, this is not my first choice, you know. But there's a promise of restoration in all the message of the prophets, right, in, um, in Jeremiah 30. For behold, the days are cl- coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave their forefathers, and they shall possess it. And, of course, this is all hinging on the people actually returning. Because the fact that they're still scattered abroad, though they have their land, re- they regained their land in 1948 and all that kind of stuff, but they're largely scattered still, not figuratively and in real life. I mean, they largely don't believe, they don't practice, they don't believe in God. They're, many of them are agnostic or atheist. And so they're scattered still, in the, but the Lord is going to bring them back to their land uh, once they repent and call on him. So the message in the prophets is very clear throughout. And we could go through all the prophets and find the same message. I've called you. Don't act like this. Act like this. If you don't, there's judgment. If you repent, I will bless you. If you walk in my commandment, everlasting blessing will come when I return. It's kind of like the message of all the prophets. And really, as we've talked about many times before, the same spirit that brought this message, that's going to breathe life into the dead and give everlasting life, like the same spirit dwells within us, the same spirit speaks through us, it only seems to make sense that the same message should be proclaimed. Yeah. The message would not change. He's not changing a message. He, that's not what he came to, that's not what he's doing. You know, he's the same today, forever, and always. And so the spirit's message coming from us ought to be the same when it comes out. Repent. The Lord is coming back. And if you do, you're going to, get, get, you're going to receive everlasting life. I mean, it's an amazing thing. That is a prophetic message. Yeah. Because right. it's the message that the Spirit gave the prophets to speak. 
And this is what, and if this is what, if prophets aren't saying this, aren't communicating this message, then it, 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 uh, it would be a good idea to question what it is that they're saying and whose message it is. Because the message from God and from the spirit that inspired the message is always the same. Turn to the Lord and he will give you everlasting life. Go your own way and it is a path that leads to destruction. And as people who want to be a prophetic people, who want the Lord to speak through them and, and all this, it ought to bear the same message. If, it, if it's from the Spirit, it will bear the same message. Whether it's calling, you know, of course these are largely speaking to Israel and the, and the Jewish people, but it would be the same to us. We would say to someone, you need to repent. Yeah. And if you do, everlasting life will be your, will be your reward. If you don't, there is destruction awaiting. And that was the Lord's message it's All throughout the prophets. That's what Jesus it, and And that's because the message hasn't changed. <laughs> and, and it's never going to change. And so w- when we talk about the spirit dwelling within us and us wanting to proclaim the message and the good news, that message has been proclaimed for many thousands of years and it hasn't changed. And it shouldn't change when we proclaim it either. Yeah. And so that's my conclusion is the spirit's message is the same. Let's check ourselves. If the message we think coming, if we're preaching a message that we think, or we're prophesying, we're in a prophetic meeting or whatever, and, and we think the Lord is moving with us, the message ought to be consistent. It ought to be able to be checked and be like, yeah, the Lord would say that that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I always kind of think, I want, I want if like the apostles were next to me or Jesus or the, you know, prophets or whatever, I, I would like them to be like, yeah, I, I'm, I, that makes sense to me. If they're, if they're just kind of like <laughs> staring at me as I'm speaking, I'm not feeling that great. I, I want them to, uh, to recognize the message because the goal is that I'm preaching the same message that they did. You know? and so, um, but the Spirit's message is, was the same in the prophets, in the patriarchs, in the apostles, at the end of the age to all of us yeah. lowly Gentiles. Like the, the message is the same. The Spirit is the same. I mean, he's regarded us to give us the same spirit that fell upon the Messiah and that raised him from the dead. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. Yeah. And if he dwells within us, he will speak the same message. Amen. And may he empower us and equip us, strengthen us to preach that message to anyone we can get to listen to us. That's right. Amen. Amen. You know, at, next week, I'll be talking a little bit about... Holy Spirit in the Gospels, um, and just challenge you guys just a little bit as you think about this. Caleb just said it. Uh, Jesus subjected himself to be human. He subjected himself to the Spirit. He could have been that second person of the Trinity, <laughs> but he chose to subject himself, so he followed the Spirit. Mm. And I think, oh my goodness. He, he did that on purpose. He could have done things differently if he wanted to. but and he, and he does it, and Peter talks about Jesus being our example. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh my gosh, we subject ourselves to the Spirit. Then we're doing what Jesus did, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, mm-hmm. And, and I look at that and I think, it, the man Christ Jesus didn't uh, just do things out of his flesh. <laughs> right. He subjected himself to the Spirit and followed what the Father was doing, and in doing so, it, it changed everything. You know, and and that promise that comes to us, where Jesus talks about, "I'm going to give you my Spirit." It's huge. You mm-hmm. know? It, it, it's that same Spirit that that we that we see all through the Old Testament, and those guys were familiar with that message, and. And when the Spirit would come upon, it talks about Peter in the book of Acts. What, what did he say? Repent, for the mm-hmm. kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, you know? awesome. he, he says, you guys crucified the Lord of glory. You know, you need to turn from your ways. And, and they did. You know, and you just think, oh my goodness. There's a, it's a beautiful thing. The awesome. storyline that we see yeah. all through the whole scripture is is profound and wonderful, and um, and so next week we'll talk a little bit about the Gospels, you know, Amen. and in particular John, which is just.
profound. So cool, man. And then Harry is going to come and uh, shut it down. Shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> On the last Thursday night, he's going to talk about the Book of Acts. You know, he's got the slam dunk. He gets it. Yeah, you know, we did about, a little softball know, there. Soft, he can talk about the Holy Spirit, <laughs> talk about the Book of Acts. Um, <laughs> and so, so Harry will be here for that last week, uh, our last Thursday night. But then in June, um, we're going to finish up our the, the rest of the teaching on the Holy Spirit through through the epistles, you know, and, and talk a little bit about some of those other things. And that probably will not be in the uh, podcast mode that we will start in. in that will probably start in July. Most likely we'll finish up in June doing what we've done before and just posting it on our, 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 our YouTube channel and we can listen to it there. And so, so that's kind of, kind of the scoop.